an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Tonight, the Conservative former Defence, now Business Minister, Anna Subri, Labour's Shadow Home Secretary, Andy Burnham, The Guardian leader writer, former editor of the French Daily Le Monde, just back from Paris, Natalie Nougared, the military historian, Daily Mail columnist, former editor of the Daily Telegraph, Max Hastings, the broadcaster, Mehdi Hassan, based in Washington now, working for the television station Al Jazeera English, and the Russian and British businessman, Evgeny Lebedev, owner of The Independent and of The Evening Standard. Thank you, thank you very much. And as ever, of course, at home, if you want to text or tweet, comment on the programme, our hashtag is BBCQT. You can follow us at BBC Question Time. You can text comments to 83981, and you can, at least for the moment, press the red button to see what others are saying. Let's have our first question from Nina Palmer, please. Is it time to take full military action against ISIS? Anna Subri. In short, yes. What we need to do, though, and this is, you know, I, I, say, I think it's really important that everybody, if I may say, understands that nobody likes to say yes because we understand that that is a very dangerous thing to do and it puts lots of people's lives at risk. But it is the right thing to do now because of what has happened in France, in Paris, the city of love that has been turned into this terrible, these terrible scenes which I think have touched everybody's hearts and rightly so but it, it's shown us really as if we didn't know what isis really is like and it's a, a barbarity and a brutality i actually don't think we've ever seen the like of this before and so we do need to take that action and we need to take it as quickly as we can but i also want to say this we need to take it with political consensus as much as we can i'm really pleased to hear the words of alex salmond the uh, foreign affairs spokesman for the snp uh, we have our differences, but I think he often is a, he speaks a lot of sense at times, uh, and he speaks with authority. Uh, and I think he's beginning to talk the, same la the right language, if I may say. And I look forward to Labour also coming with us and other parties. So we can, if we can, build a consensus, but we need to get on with this. Oh, and unfortunately, we need to act quickly. But Time Nina Palmer's us. question was to take full military action. What do you mean by full military action? Anna Subri. Well, at the moment, we mean airstrikes. We're not talking about boots on the ground. I know there is an argument that that is a, a more effective or an additional way uh, of taking on these terrorists. But we do now need to join our international colleagues. I mean, we're working in Iraq and we're taking action there. But now we need to extend that right. into Syria. But it's not against the Syrians. Make it very clear, this is not the same as 2013 when the vote was taken about Syria and Assad and what he was doing with chemical weapons. This is about ISIS and time is against us. Unfortunately, we need to get on and sort this out. All right. I've got a number of hands up and I'll come to you in a moment. Let's just hear from Mehdi Hassan. Full military action. Um, well, let's start with the point that there's already military action going on. ISIS has already been bombed uh, for more than a year now and that hasn't made as much difference as perhaps uh, those who were in favour of that uh, were saying a year ago. Look, for me, I remember 9-11. When I think about Paris, I think about the, the major atrocity uh, of our lifetimes was the September the 11th attacks. And what did we do after 9-11? Uh, we had a president who declared war. We went into Afghanistan all guns blazing. We had airstrikes. We supported rebel groups on the ground. And we toppled the ISIS of 2001, the Taliban, horrific regime. And we patted ourselves on the back. And 14 years later, we're still stuck in Afghanistan fighting a brutal Taliban insurgency. We're still fighting terrorists across the world. Who today believes that the world is any safer today than it was on September the 12th, 2001? In fact, the opposite. The opposite. And the 
So no, no action is your view, is it? Not no action at all, but the idea of full military action... So a, what, what action? Well, the, the number one way you're going to defeat ISIS. There's a reason why ISIS is thriving in Syria and Iraq, because those are two broken, war-torn countries. If you're going to defeat ISIL in Syria, the very first thing you have to do is get some kind of ceasefire and political right. solution Look, doing that in Syria. Well. And the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, led by a Conservative yeah. MP, pointed out that your government hasn't made the case for airstrikes no. because it has no coherent strategy and because airstrikes distract us all but from what really needs to be done on the ground. I, get Saudi Arabia, right. get Iran, no, no. get those countries around the table and get Assad, get Assad to stop the killing. Well, that's what we're doing. This is only one thing of what we're doing. This is only one thing of what we're doing. The man in white there, no white shirt. Unfortunately, the conflict in the Middle East dates back to the 700th century. So political solution right this second is out of the question for both sides at the moment. And, and the man there in the check shirt on the, on the gangway, you, sir. Uh, yeah, Anna, you talk about political consensus. But well, earlier on today, I was reading the BBC, and it said David Cameron was willing to take action without a UN mandate because of the Russians blocking it with the veto. Oh, that's now, different. Now, yeah, but I seem to remember a few years ago when we were going into Iraq, and Tony Blair didn't have a, uh, a mandate from the UN, that that has become his legacy ever since. How would that be OK for David Cameron to do it, t like, 10, 12 years later? But it wasn't OK right. back then. Okay. Do you want to answer? No. Okay. Max Hastings. I agree with everything that uh, was just said on the other side of the table about um, the need for caution at this stage. Anybody who pretends the answers are easy are the people we should mistrust. Quite it's so. much easier. One thing's easier to say. We have to strengthen domestic security against terrorism here in Europe. That's the easy part. But what we do, ab <laughs> but what we do abroad... Um, the great principle that one should always act on is don't make things any worse. Yeah. And we talk about building consensus, but consensus for what? I know hardly anybody in the military field who believes that simply bombing in Syria is going to achieve anything unless yeah. there is also a political and diplomatic offensive. So do I. Uh, and, and, sorry, Max. I also, and, unless there's also what? Unless there's also what? Unless there is also well, a political and diplomatic well. offensive. Yeah, but this well, is there's not, not much in but the Max, as you know, this is not just about taking airstrikes against ISIS. This is only, that is only part of all the other things that we're doing, including finding a short and long-term solution in Syria and indeed in Iraq. This is just another thing. But this yeah, but is can we get this in the right order? So that at the moment, the, the first thing that's got to be done, whether you like it or not, the Russians have got to be talked to. But we there can be no that. deal in Syria We've without talking that. to the Russians at the moment. But, uh, but as Cameron far as I can has done that. He's right. already talked right. to Putin. Anna, all right. uh, Andy Burnham, let's just hear from you. There's, uh, I'll come to people in the audience when we've heard the selection of uh, views from here. Which side are you on in this, in this argument? Well, in the circumstances we find ourselves this week, it would be wrong to rule anything out. Uh, this is an attack on our way of life. I don't think we can just sit by and just, just accept it. But, and there does come a but, I've sat in Parliament this week and I've had a growing feeling that we're back where we were ten or more years ago, I think as Mehdi was saying, and not learning the lessons of the last decade. What were the two big lessons of Iraq? As the gentleman says, number one, the UN mandate. That was a failure on our part. We should have worked to get that. We didn't get it. Now we should be working for it. I heard it was reported, it might be wrong, that Cameron met Putin in Vienna last week, but didn't once raise the question of the UN. Now, we need to see evidence that he wants to get that UN mandate, because you need to build consensus here. You need to build solidarity to take on this, this question. And he should be working hard to get that UN Are mandate. Are you saying it wouldn't be legitimate unless he got the UN uh, mandate? Because in, in the House of Commons he said it would be desirable, but made clear it wasn't an essential qualification. I, I think that you'd have to look at the circumstances. If it was unachievable, we've got four of the five permanent members now involved in, in some way, right. either doing airstrikes in one country or both. So the circumstances are building and we've had progress with, with Russia. But the second question is this, and it's an important <coughs> one. The second failure of Iraq was the failure to plan for the aftermath. That was the failure. And that actually... <laughs> and that actually, let's, let's be honest, and I'm speaking to somebody who voted uh, for that intervention, that failure to plan led to the conditions that we see. Uh, what's, your, what's your really well, saying, let me, let, me, let me just finish the point. So there has to be a plan for Syria, doesn't there? There has to be a plan for what's going to happen on the ground. Syria is so complex now with all of the different groups. <coughs> if you just bomb, what's <coughs> going to happen on the ground? But it's not so so the conditions so, are being created here for, for a plan Syria. for Syria. 
And the Prime Minister must present <coughs> that plan that has international backing so that if there is to be action, there is then a plan so, for the so future of Syria. All right, let's just What's clarify this, Andy. So the idea that uh, British warplanes, which already bomb in Iraq, uh, cannot cross over the phony border into Syria, um, you would oppose them doing that. You'd oppose any extension of air power unless there was... UN agreement, agreement on the future no, of Syria and all these other things. I didn't quite say all that. Right, well, can you clarify I didn't quite what you did say. I want to see the Prime Minister straining every sinew to get that UN backing. And I'm saying tonight that that looks possible now, given the progress with Russia and given the fact that members of the Security Council, are, most of them are now committed one way or another. It looks possible. He should be prioritising that, not just saying it would be nice to have right. if we could get it. He needs to get that UN mandate, because if he gets it, we'll be in a much stronger can position I, going forward. Okay, can, now, I, uh, yes. can, I, can I say about, 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 the, about the UN man mandate? We all know that uh, for the four years that the Syrian civil war has been going on for, Russia has presented three times its veto in the UN Security Council, blocking that UN mandate. Exactly. Now, Russia will, I think, only agree to a resolution if the text of that resolution says that Assad, the Syrian president who's had his army bombing civilians for four years now and creating a huge human toll, he's responsible for the overall majority of the 250 or to, to 3,000 people who've been killed in Syria, Russia will want to make sure that he's co considered as an ally. And this is, the, this is the, the problem we face right now. The person who has set his own country to fire and caused this tragedy in Syria, which has, what has happened in Paris this, this, this past week, is basically the Syrian civil war flowing out, f exporting its disorder and its horrors to our European soil. And we are all faced, as Europeans, we're now faced with this problem. And I think it revolves centrally around, around stopping the massacres and the atrocities that Assad has been carrying out. But who are we, who are we for in Syria? Let me just come, let's, let, 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 Evgeny, you were hearing about Putin's involvement. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about the possibility now of an alliance between countries in Europe which uh, I very uh, much hope will be achieved very, very soon because I think it's absolutely crucial that we work together to defeat something that I truly believe is the biggest threat humanity is facing mm -hmm. so far in the 21st century. When I read about ISIS first time um, at the beginning of or Islamic State, the formation of the Islamic State and, and, the, and the potential threat that I saw it would be posing to, um, to our way of life because their whole um, their whole culture, their whole way of living and the whole uh, premise on which they exist is, is to fight against our way of life. The, the aim of the caliphate is to um, spread the caliphate across all the world's Muslims and to spread Islam across the world. I don't know how much more, uh, how many more atrocities need to happen in order for people to wake up, for the governments to wake up, to work together to, dis to defeat this enemy. We've had uh, so far, Tunisia, we've had Beirut, we've had Turkey, we've had the downing of a Russian plane uh, with 224 innocent um, civilians, and last weekend we had Paris. The terrible, I just, the I'll, just, I'll, just, I'll just say one. one, 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 one let, let him, yeah. let him, let him yeah. if, if, Putin, no. if Putin was bombing ISIS, he's, why did he's, ISIS claim to bring down the Russian plane? Can I just add one more thing? You mentioned 9 11 earlier, and you mentioned Taliban and Al Qaeda. Al Qaeda trained and existed on. Uh, Taliban controlled Afghanistan land and the atrocity that was committed on American soil on 9-11 was absolutely outrageous. Now, Islamic State is much more sophisticated than Al-Qaeda was then. Can you just imagine what they're capable of doing? Um, uh, one, one point, what, uh, the question that uh, Nina Palmer asked was, is it time to take full military action? What military action do you think, I, I think would, would, should be taken and Russia would agree to? I think at the moment there's, there's a need for coordinated airstrikes and I completely agree with Max that uh, um, uh, airstrikes on their own are not um, going to solve this. But as um, I learn and as I speak to actually independent newspaper correspondents who I believe, particularly Patrick Coburn, who I think is one of the greatest world experts on ISIS, in fact he's just written a book on ISIS, um, a coalition on, on, of ground forces that are fighting already on, on Syrian land together with airstrikes of, um, of allied forces of the West and Russia is the solution so far. 
Okay, Let, thank you very much. Let's hear from some members of our audience. The, the woman there, and the, yes, you. Um, it seems to me as though we're fighting a very unconventional and an evolving enemy. So is conventional warfare really the solution? I don't think it is. The bo going in and bombing people, it doesn't seem the solution. It hasn't worked so far. In, in what sense is it, is, it, is it not? Well, I mean, it, it's, do they really have boundaries? Do, we ha do they have specific land boundaries? They seem to be infiltrating the whole world. So going in and just bombing a specific part of the world doesn't Ma seem Max the solution Max uh, uh, what do the military say about how you can take on ISIS? You've <laughs> talked about the need for a political solution, but on the military front, the military you're a military, military historian. The military is very divided. Um, the, there are um, some military leaders who would like to see us go in there and bomb. But the problem is still, and the friends whom I respect most feel this, Nobody around this table tonight has yet defined what are our objectives, whose side are we on? No, it is not enough to be against Assad and against ISIS. No. I would have thought that everything we've learned in the last 14 years has shown Max. the dangers yeah. of Max. lunging into... Max, Max, the question was about ISIS. And you're, if I may say, you're confusing it with our dispute with Assad. We're not Sorry, talking. Hang on. 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 Hang in Paris, but also the downing of the jet. I think, Anna, this now is where is the time to go over the Anna, this is where there's and a problem. Back. The and government's back, argument, I think, has been too simplistic because <clears throat> you're trying to separate these two things completely. And you're trying to say there's ISIL here <clears throat> and then there's Assad and the civil war here. These two things can't be separated in that way. Okay. If you were to bomb in Raqqa and around that area, you've then got a very complex situation on the ground because of the civil Andy, war, you and you just don't know All right. Andy, what you you're creating okay. you on the ground. You two have to make a choice. So and the, select, I say, the select committee said to the government, and uh, Anna, it said to the yeah. government, you cannot separate these things in the way that you're trying and, to do. And, the and the you've got to answer that as a government yes, before you can expect All right. any concerns. All right, hold it, you two. Hold it, you two. We agree on that. If you think you agree, fine. Let's hear what our audience thinks. The man there in spectacles. And now I come to you down here in the front. You, sir. Is it not more realistic to talk about engaging ISIS, potentially driving a wedge between the various factions that constitute ISIS, but also the reality surely is not about eliminating ISIS, but a policy of containment? Because the idea that they're somehow going to be eliminated from the region, I think, is ridiculous. And what do you mean by containment? And how would it prevent well, I think the policy... how, would it pre how would it prevent uh, Paris happening? Well, it looks as though the successes that have already been achieved, if, they are, if they are, we, we are to believe, is about taking out leaders. It's about taking out the, the higher echelons of um, ISIS in an attempt to hold back the movement and hold back um, the... the, the the, the, the spread of, um, All right. of the control. No, hold on, hold on, panel. Let's, I want to hear members of our audience, because I think the people watching would like to hear what they have to say. It's to obvious you. that you're very keen to go in and bomb and to have massive not military action. Keen, keen or not keen, you think it's now the time to do so. How are you going to protect against massive collateral damage and civilian loss? Mm. Because these poor people are being attacked by Assad, their own government, and they're being attacked now by our forces. The French went in and bombed today. I don't know if you've seen the images of the loss of life, children, hospitals. Where did these people turn? Because they can't turn to well, us. All right, Natalie. Natalie, uh, President Hollande said France is at war. What, what's your answer to her? Um, it's obvious that a, I think a, a policy would, that would be just about strike airstrikes is, 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 has its obvious limits and its dangers, the, the ones you just mentioned. Um, I think as, uh, in, concerning those particular dangers, collateral damage, I would worry much more because I've, I've covered the war in Chechnya 10 years ago and I would worry much more about the collateral damage from Russian bombs than from Western bombs at this, at this point in time. But it's obvious that just airstrikes will, will, will not do it. So we're, we're, we're facing a very complex situation where I don't think ISIS can be convinced 
or, or I don't, it doesn't look like it's an entity that you could sort of break down into different tendencies yeah. and trends. Yeah. Right. Uh, these are highly so ideologized you people. No, you really, you, we have to take, I, and look, nobody wants to do this. Nobody has a happy heart doing it. It's just that because of where we are, we can't negotiate with these people. They're beyond reason and almost humanity. And it's with huge regret right. We've made that, this but point. we're I'm joining right, in fine. what fine. others are doing. Uh, the, the woman there with the spectacles, three in, and then I'll come to you because you've had your hand up some time. Yes, you first of all. Hi. Um, should we not be investigating who is actually funding ISIS? Yes. And who is giving them... <laughs> uh, uh, with the idea that it can be, can be stopped, the funding? Oh, yes. Well, yes. Yeah, so who is buying oil, potentially, from them? Who is giving them weapons? Who is giving them yeah. arms, for example? And should we not sanction countries that are funding them? Is that not more of an approach the UN should take in All general? Right. It's yeah. a good point. Good point. Who would, would you pick it up Agreed. on? Maybe? Uh, well, the problem with that is, unfortunately, a lot of the weapons that we supply to Syrian rebels in the past have ended up in the hands of ISIS. Do we sanction ourselves? Is there a slight problem? And that's the danger with the grey no, area. But, but what about the, what about agree, the money that's flowing now? I think it's outrageous. Now. I, think it's yeah. I think it's outrageous that ISIS is selling two million dollars of oil a day. Yeah. I think that's outrageous. Yeah. It's outrageous that the coalition only just started bombing uh, the oil oil routes now. But just in terms of coming back to the point, you've really made a very good point about the Sorry, plane. Sorry, just to clarify, you'd like the uh, oil routes bombed? I'm saying and that. And the oil wells no, bombed? No, I'm saying I'm saying if you're going to take military action against ISIL, if you're going to take military action, do that. Do that. Quite, bombing Raqqa, to. you're bombing you're bombing a city of people. Yeah, to clarify, you approve of the bomb. No, my, no, my, my view on military action is ISIS cannot be defeated without a component of military action. Should it be the West? All no. Right. I don't think it should be the Western forces because that raises a whole other issue uh, in the Middle East with blowback. And I just want to say to Anna one thing. Look, if military action is the right course of action, if we decide that's the right thing to do, fine. But at least let's be honest about the consequences. It's not cost-free. Plenty of ISIS experts have said Did this week, and Yevgeny made the point, that Russia has attacked ISIS and an airliner went down. Hezbollah is fighting with ISIS. Beirut was bombed. France is bombing ISIS. Paris was bombed. We have to, you know, there no, is Medi, consequences Medi, to had, our foreign policy. Course, right, but Medi, there have been seven thwarted attacks in the last 12 months on our country, but David, on our but people. Your, your Prime Minister so this danger is there now. Agreed, it's only because we've agreed, contained but them. David Cameron, the David Cameron, Anna, went on Andrew Marr and said Russia intervening in Syria leads to more terrorism and more radicalization. But why don't we Okay, so different was, types of intervention don't was, lead to different types of blowback. He was supporting Assad. We're talking about... We'll be supporting Assad right, if we right, go in right, and only right. take on Thank ISIS. you very much. That's I'll go to the missing. woman there in, uh, on the gangway. You, yes. I'd like to go back to your first statement that you made, Anna. You said that ISIS is a threat. I'd like to remind you that the Assad regime has killed seven times more people than what ISIS has done this year alone. When will Assad will become a threat? Is it when he attacks a European country? Because that's what it seems like to us as well. But what do you think of IS? Of course it doesn't represent Islam. It goes there, you know, acting in the name of Islam, saying that, yep, we are going to take over and we're doing this for the sake of Islam. It doesn't. My heart goes out to the people who were attacked in Paris. But again, now we've got the whole situation with, you know, we have to apologize, we have to do this. But what I'm trying to ask you is that ISIS, you said it's a threat. Assad is a bigger threat. Why don't you take that into I, account? I don't think he's a bigger threat. But we, and I agree with your analysis of uh, the barbarity of his regime. Parliament took a vote that we would not get involved in that internal civil war uh, against Assad. We are working diplomatically in Vienna, as I've described, working with our allies. I'm talking about ISIS and the need now, unfortunately, to take those airstrikes, which others right, are doing, to join in that coalition. All right, thank you. I, I don't want to stop you, but I don't want no, to... Right. I, there are I five other people. No, you will. I know you will. The man there in blue. Um, I'd like I'm to talk a point this. of what yes. um, Ifghani mentioned about um, when you spoke of us and them, of non-Islamic individuals and Islamic individuals. And I just want to reiterate that Islamic State doesn't represent Muslims at all. They don't well, represent 1.5 billion Muslims. Um, apart from that, I did agree with a lot of what you said. And also, I'd like to address Mehdi's point, which is, why is it that we criticise Russia's stance, but not our own stance in terms of military action? OK. I'm going to take a, a, another question. Uh, we get, go, we've got a number of questions all on the, the topic. Um, I'll come to you, sir, in a moment, and I'll come to you. Um, it's from Simon War in just a moment. Um, I should just say, though, as ever, uh, where we're going to be next. Uh, we're in Manchester next week, and we're in Birmingham the week after that. And on the screen is the number if you want to come. Um, we will be back in Belfast, where we were <coughs> due to be tonight. We'll be back there in 
January. Um, Simon Ward, please, and I'll come to you too in a moment. Simon. Isn't declaring all-out war on ISIS precisely what they want us to do? Natalie. Yeah. I think, I think you have a point there. I think, I think they do want to attract as much retalia retaliation and response as possible, uh, possibly even ground troops, which I, I think would be a dangerous option from a Western perspective. Um, and we've seen the results of ground operations elsewhere, which weren't quite convincing. Um, so I do think that one has to be careful with, with that kind of vocabulary. It's clear that the French president used that kind of vocabulary because because of the, of the, the uh, utter horror of what had happened in, in Paris and the pain that everybody felt and that there was a need to, to put everybody in mobilization mode. And, and um, so that, that was clearly a rhetoric that he felt would be able to rally people in France but also people beyond France. And I, I do want to make the point that um, French people have been extremely sensitive and, and touched by the, 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 the signals of support and the messages of support that, that they've been getting. But I do think that this, it's important, just as you debate in this country what your country is going to do, it's important to see the larger European uh, angle. And I think it's important to keep in mind that we need to do something together and show that we are in this together and not fragmented each and every nation on its own. And, and yeah. Simon, you say it may be that all-out war may be precisely what ISIS wants. Are you suggesting that no military action should be taken because military action is what ISIS wants to provoke? Yes, I do. So what do I, you think should happen? I think they should go by divide and rule. That's what ISIS have had their nose put out of joint because everybody is flooding across to Western Europe. They want to turn Muslims in Europe against other Muslims. We, well, I read in the paper some incident in Scotland where some poor innocent Muslim man uh, in a, in a um, shop was, was, was threatened because of this. That's exactly what ISIS want. The more we uh, attack them, we bomb them, innocent Muslims are going to be slaughtered. They'll say, look what the West are doing to us again, and that they're going to hopefully <laughs> then get the support. All right. um, OK, and, and you sat down the gangway. Uh, we've heard a, a lot about um, strategy and what is David Cameron's strategy tonight. But I just raised this question. Um, President Hollande declared war against ISIS. Um, France is a member of NATO. Uh, and as I understand it, the philosophy of NATO is that if one member is attacked, all members are attacked. So what is NATO's strategy? Max Hastings, what do you think NATO should do? Well, we're still coming to terms with a huge problem of non-state enemies, which is something new to this generation that in the days of the old days of NATO, we knew who the enemy was. It was the Soviet Union. But now this is a new world, and everybody is still trying to, trying to feel their way to um, how to deal with this. And it isn't easy because it was by no means um, a, 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 a silly point that was put about the notion that would we be doing what ISIS wanted by attacking them. They're putting out videos all the time, um, challenging the West to come and fight them on the ground. That, Everything I've heard so far this evening, outrage is not a substitute for policy. Yeah. And nobody has yet told me, we've heard a lot, we all loathe ISIS and everything it stands for. We all recoil from Assad. But if we're going to launch military action, who are we for? Who are we aiming to support? And I think it's absolutely right that NATO or France or Britain stops I, to answer that question right. before we launch any military all right. action. All right. Let, let's, hold on, maybe you've said quite a lot. Let, let's hear the... Let's hear the Jeremy Corbyn take on this. <laughs> well, no, this is, this is well, my take on it. I want to come back to what Simon said, because I think he put it very well indeed. Uh, they want us to be forced into knee-jerk responses that might make the situation worse, that might polarise. That's what this is designed to do. It's designed to divide us, isn't it? It's yep. designed to set one country against yes. another. It's designed to set one religion against another. It's designed to make us want to turn our back on refugees, which, in my view, we mustn't... Uh, do. That's what it's designed to do and we need to think that through and it's why we mustn't let that happen. It's why that UN route is so important because if we're not allowing ourselves yeah. to be divided we will then be in a stronger position if we hold together that is how we'll but prevail. Hold on. What, what, you're, what you seem to be suggesting is that, that uh, the Prime Minister will get parliamentary approval here 
and from Labour, including Jeremy Corbyn, if there's UN, uh, if the UN route is taken, and otherwise it's a rather iffy question. Well, he hasn't put his proposal, David, has no, he? No, I know he that, hasn't but I'm, I'm just... He hasn't I'm put his proposal... We don't know yet what he wants to do, so it's, it's premature, we... but... I, I'm, I'm saying to you that I think the question is a very, very good one uh, because that, that is understanding the nature of what we're confronting here and we need to become more sophisticated than we were in the last okay, decade. I agree with that. The country that was attacked right, you have in the keep first your place shorter, often has an impulse no, to strike back Sydney, straight yeah. away. What we should try and do is do it together, okay. as the gentleman said, as Andy, NATO, you have to, as an European you, you Union. Must, you must problem. all please, on the panel, keep your remarks just a bit and more taut because otherwise nobody in the audience will get a chance to speak and half the panel won't get a chance to speak. I agree with Maybe. Andy that we need to be sophisticated and I worry about the language of war. I get totally why President Hollande uh, talked in that way. I get his desire for vengeance, wanting to be pitiless. I'd probably say the same thing in his position. But let's not forget, war is traditionally about between two states. Why give these cowardly, pathetic criminals the prestige and status that they so desperately crave as warriors and soldiers in which they do not deserve okay. by talking the language of war? All right. And yeah. if they feed off war, I would just feed off war. The woman at the back there, on the, on the gangway, yes, what's your view? In the month of Remembrance Sunday, I find it astonishing that we're not thinking about the human cost to our UK troops and the fact that we know after the last two wars the amount of damage that did to our troops, the number of lives that were lost. Last week, 8,000 veterans that have served for this country were homeless. When we're talking about long-term strategy, we need to think about how we're going to deal with that. Our mental health resources, supporting those with PTSD, supporting people that are living on the street. It's appalling are you the way no, that we're no, treating our Are you own. saying no act of war is legitimate in self-defence or for whatever purpose? I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying if we're going to be putting our troops on the ground and in a vulnerable position, we need to not only think about the cost to civilian life in that country, right. but the cost to the, our Quite troops right. and our public <clears throat> services and how we're going to support them, which we're failing to do at the moment. Okay. And you, sir, over there with the blue shirt on. <laughs> yes. So, uh, politicians all the way up to our previous uh, Prime Minister Tony Blair, commentators, experts have all acknowledged that our foreign policy has, has partly led to the unrest in the region mm. and even recruitment to um, bodies like ISIS. I'm concerned as a citizen of this country that any unilateral action will lead to more recruitment into ISIS and more unrest in the region. How, how can we I avoid we, that? We we're suppressing, and I, and I we're suppressing lessons learned from Iraq could, with, with, with look, the delay in the Chilcot inquiry. Look, uh, look, I'm no hawk. I actually was very much against the invasion of Iraq. And if I'd been in Parliament at the time, I can assure you, I wouldn't have voted for it. But in the extraordinary circumstances which we are in, with this, um, we've never known anything like ISIS. And it's not just about what they did in Paris or what they did with the aeroplane or in Baghdad. It's also the fact that they behead people, that they kill, they murder people because they are gay. They are, are beyond barbarity. We've never known anything like this before. And I have to say, yes, there are other things that we are... There are other things that we are doing. This is not in isolation, right. but I just wanted to very quickly say, do you, am I allowed? Do you, know that, do you know that Saudi Arabia beheads people and we're right. quite close allies with Saudi Arabia? I know. That is a that sounds like apologism. They don't go onto the streets of it's Paris and shoot the people in the way I'm, that they did. Don't try and make out that the You said beheadings, I'm just pointing out. No, you're just making a cheap point. This is beyond Quite cheap political it's actually, points. Hold on, hold on, hold on. It's, no, not, it's, it's beyond like, that. It's not, you know, Maybe it's, it's it beyond that. It is not a cheap that. point, Anna. It actually goes to the heart of our policy in the Middle East. You so want to talk about airstrikes and miss... No, you reevaluate what is the West doing in the Middle East. Are we taking the right stances in the various conflicts? Right now, a bunch of Arab countries are bombing Yemen, the poorest country in the Middle East. We are helping them do that. Uh, America is helping. Uh, Tomorrow, yeah. we'll say, yeah. but why are they You just yeah, clean right, this right, stuff right, in right. to muddy yeah. the waters right, and it does you no credit. You don't, right. No, all right, don't, don't no, have a spat Yemen, between Yemen the two doesn't matter, does it? Only people in Paris matter. What are you trying to say? I'm, I'm raising an important that. issue. I'm there are people dying in Yemen. I am not saying that. Yevgeny. Right, and you know that, Megan. You are better than these cheap points. I would, I would just go back to, to Simon's original question about whether this is exactly what they want us to do. 
And I would say no, because they wouldn't be able to withstand the military might of a united force. The trouble with what's happening now is that it's very, very disjointed. So the French are doing something, the Russians are doing something, the Brits are not even doing anything on Syrian territory. And I think the idea if, they, if we leave them alone, they will leave us alone, is, is, is really not going to work. And, naive, and I'll tell you why, because, because as, as, Anne, as Anne pointed out earlier, there have been seven possible attacks foiled in this country just this year, and that's a terrifying that's thought. That's if we, David, may I just say, to, uh, answer to that, well, if we do try and obliterate ISIS, we're going to kill a lot of uh, innocent civilians at the same time. That, that is going to breed more discontent, in the mid, which is going to lead to other groups. Uh, we may get rid of ISIS. Right, you've made your point. Thank but you very another, much. Another group but will grow. Thank you very much. Trouble is Max, ISIS is one, not like other one groups. One thing that's essential, Anna, is we keep a sense of proportion. You keep saying this is an unprecedented threat. This is quite untrue. That in the Second World War and the First World War, this country faced far graver challenges. Yeah. ISIS is a disease. But it's Mike, a very argue, unpleasant disease. Mike. But the Soviet Union, this is not, this is Mike, not an existential Mike. threat. Mike. And the one thing that will not help us all is if politicians in senior positions such as you grossly exaggerate. I, ISIS is not an existential threat to our society. We keep our nerve and we act sensibly and we do not make things worse by precipitate military action. Sorry, We're going to see this there's, through. There's I'm quite been, sure we shall prevail. All right. but not by I just wanted to address your point that this country has faced extraordinary, enormous threats in the First World War and the Second World War, but I would argue that this threat is just as strong as the one we faced in the I Second World War. I couldn't agree with that, Gergeny. We're not going to be invading and occupied. No, no, we're going to be shot. Be trust no, no, be atrocities. Can you, can you please, one person at a time, Natalie, please. I, th I think we're facing a... Uh, uh, a very, very scary uh, phenomenon, which is a combination of territories con con controlled t t today in Syria and in Iraq, controlled by ISIS, networks that feed into Europe, that exist, there are ISIS cells in Europe, and then there's the ideology of ISIS, which spreads online and which tries to target young Muslims in Europe, but not just young Muslims, but um, we, we, we know this is a completely new phenomenon. They, have, they want to cast themselves as a state, and they do have some of the attributes of the state, because they, they do have hard, hard military equipment, uh, heavy military equipment, and they claim even to produce their own money. So we're dealing with a phenomenon which, which is quite new. I think the point isn't to ask whether the West or Europe hasn't made mistakes in the Middle East. Of course it's made mistakes in the Middle East. But th we're not, that's not the question today. The, the question today is how to get it right and how to understand that the new dimension is that this thing going on in the Middle East is now coming to us. That's, that's, the, that's the new phenomenon. And it's not quite the first time. There have been uh, bombings in London, in Madrid, in the last decade or so. So it's not quite the first time, but the magnitude of what has happened in Paris forces us to, for, to, to get it right this time. And I think we can only do that if we work together and if we identify that the main factor that has grown ISIS these last years has been the massacres, the massacres carried out of Sunni populations by the Assad regime. In Syria, that has been the main reason for the growth of ISIS. All right. And I, I'm going to move on to a, a slightly different question. Amy Anderson, please. How are British citizens supposed to feel protected when Europe has welcomed jihadis back into our world as apparent refugees? How is Britain, British citizens supposed to feel protected when Europe is wel welcoming jihadis back as apparent mm -hmm. refugees? I mean, Yevgeny. Well, I think... The, the original response of, of Europeans was, was very, very admirable mm. because, you know, the pictures that we saw, and actually the independent newspaper was the, was the for, first one to publish the picture of the little boy washed up on shore. And I think the, the fact that the Europeans welcomed refugees with open arms was very, very commendable. But that said, with, with recent events and what's happened in Paris, I think we have to, we have to review how um, we accept and, and what, we, what we do with, with the re incoming refugees and how they're accepted and, and not be as, I suppose, um, well, not free for all. I, we don't I, have I would, a free for all, they're dying I, in the water. I, I, I would say we just need to have some sort of controls and see how, how we can accept them. Okay. Nadia Hassan. Um, 
just with regard to the question, in France and Paris, as far as I'm aware, there were no refugees involved. According to the EU, every single perpetrator was an EU citizen. There has been a fake Syrian passport recovered. But there's, no, there's a fake Syrian passport recovered, but no evidence no of a refugee involvement. And you know no what? Evidence. I don't care. Let's say there were eight refugees involved. Are we going to punish four or five million Syrian refugees because four or five... So what, what, steps would you, what steps would you take to try and make sure that among the people who are taken, 20,000 is the target here in Britain, according to the Prime Minister? And we've taken 216 what, on the UN scheme. Uh, I'm though, asking the question. What, what would you do to make sure that that didn't include, or would you be indifferent to that issue? No, nobody's indifferent to well, that what issue, What would of you course. do about do you it? Need, I mean, if you look at the United States government, for example, which is dealing with this, there's already intensive vetting procedures for refugees who are coming in through resettlement schemes. In fact, if you had a more open door, I don't think we do have an open door on refugees, you'd be able to vet them better if they didn't come over on rickety boats, which is harder uh, to deal with. But you know, if you leave them in overcrowded camps on the borders of Syria, I can tell you this, they're much more prime targets for ISIL recruitment okay. than if they come here and, and Burnham, we show the world that actually there is no clash between West and Islam. Do you agree with this? <clears throat> well, I don't think there's evidence yet, as others have said. And the thing to say, the thing to stress is ISIL, ISIL wants us to turn our back on the refugees. Exactly. Well, that makes us better than them, the fact that we do welcome Absolutely. people in as, as uh, Mehdi said. So let's not ourselves get into a knee-jerk reaction on this. Mm. What could we do about it? Of course, there needs to be better control. What happened in the summer is that the Greek authorities were overwhelmed, so they couldn't process people uh, arriving on the shores of Europe. So they weren't properly getting the details down so that then the, those in, that information could be shared across Europe with the intelligence services. So gaps were there in the system. Of course, we need a much better system across Europe. I think the time has come to look again at the Schengen Agreement, this idea that you know, Europe can have no internal borders at all. It's wonderful, it's idealistic, but I think it's, it's basically designed for a different age than the one that we're, that we're now in. We need to have better control, because that better protects vulnerable, uh, vulnerable people as well. So, you know, I, I, your characterisation, your question, I don't think uh, was fair. However, it would seem that one of the individuals who went back to Belgium had been in Syria. That's, so that was it, actually mostly my point. He wasn't a refugee. We did, 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 we have found out, obviously, that the people that uh, committed the Paris atrocities were EU, yeah. you know, so original think, citizens. So you've got, you've got uh, however, what, what happened is, you know, they went to Syria, they, they committed different. further atrocities, but they were not picked up, but you, you've got and a they good, came let's, back. Let me finish your point. You have a good point there, a really good point. And, and that, and, and that I mean, bottom line, we should know who these You're people right. are. Your point's a really That's strong one. Right. And the Absolutely. point is that other member states that haven't had a history of dealing with terrorism, such as Belgium, perhaps don't have as sophisticated systems uh, to, to monitor people. And the, the characteristics of this attack, this terrible, terrible attack, was it, it was an attack planned and coordinated, coordinated in a different member state from the one in which it was carried out. So what that tells us is there now needs to be much better sh sharing of information about people Such coming in and out. a carload of explosives and Exactly. I agree with you. Guns and actually, and... there needs to be better checks at the Channel Tunnel. Because I don't think that the same border checks there with people coming in in cars, travelling on, on, um, on the shuttle. You know, we need to look at our procedures again across Europe because, you know, quite frankly, there are gaps there. All right, Druba Sikta, you've got a, a question that's very much on this point. I'd like to take it and we'll, we'll tie it in with this. Is it more necessary than ever to acknowledge the need for mass surveillance to counter homegrown terrorists? Mass surveillance to counter, uh, to counter terrorism. Um, Anna Subri. Well, we have taken a number of actions over recent years to make sure that our counterintelligence uh, is where it should be. And, and it, it sort of relates, as you say, David, to the previous question. We mustn't confuse refugees and, and all the right things that we are doing by them and what has happened uh, notably in Paris. Um, for example, I, it's, a, it's a statistic I didn't realise. 24 people last year were refused. They had their passports taken away from them so that they couldn't go uh, and join terror groups, notably in countries like Syria. Uh, and I was astonished at this figure. Nearly 100,000 people were refused entry into Britain on the grounds that they were a threat to our national security. So those checks and balances in our country, I do believe are there. And of course, we've just agreed to nearly 2,000 more officers in MI5 and MI6. What about uh, and, police, though, Anna? Well, Andy, I will quite happily deal with the question about the police. Uh, we have you're about tested. To, you're that. about to cut the police, aren't well, you? Twenty-five percent cut. No. No. 
And you made a speech, Andy, where you said that uh, it was doable, and I would like you to agree that it was doable to make cuts of between 5 and up to 10%. Do you still stand by that 5 to 10%? Yes or well, no? I, Anna, I, I'm taking a very responsible position because... You're planning 25% cuts. You don't that, know that, that. that was yes. George Osborne at the budget said unprotected departments like the Home Office five to ten percent are, are going to get cuts. Question. Wait, no, of between 20 and 25 percent. No. Would you I, take it in turns to talk and I, not talk yeah, over each be, other? Wait a minute, helpful. Andy. Both of you. No, I know you were. Both of you. Take it in turns, yeah. Andy. So I have said on advice from the police that they tell me that five percent is over five years is difficult but doable. If you go beyond that 5 to 10%, it gets more difficult. Beyond time. Go into double figures, it's very dangerous. Now, I, I've learned something, actually. I've been made aware of a letter that has been sent to the Home Secretary. It was commissioned via the COBRA committee last weekend, where the question was asked, do we have... What's the resource implications for police here in the wake of Paris? And the letter has gone back to the Home Secretary that says what I've just said that it's, it's doable to do 5% over the next five years. If you cut the police by between 5 and 10, it's difficult. But go beyond 10%, it's dangerous. That would take thousands of police officers off the beat, Anna, uh, if you do that. So I, I'm saying to you, I, I'm supporting the government in many ways in terms of what you're doing. I actually support what they're doing All right, in the mayor on, 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 on the um, investigatory on. powers bill. Right, but you've sorry. got to listen to the police sorry. and drop these plans, these said? drastic All right, Thank you very much. Sorry, he didn't uh, answer Anna's the hungry. question. Was Do you stand by your statement that I, you I, made... I, and now you're interrupting me. Did you, do you stand by your statement I stand, that 5 to 10... I, surveillance. I won't interrupt, but and, I'm and I stand by my, I stand 5 by my, to 10% Anna, is I'll let me doable. tell you what I said. I said 5 to 10... I said, look, this is getting silly. Uh, let, wait a moment. No, just, no, look, we've got serious things to talk about. Yeah, in, in, the, in the House of Commons, there's room for a lot of political tit for tat. We're talking about serious things here. He alleges. Up to the police, I'll Wait a moment. You, you're saying that a five percent cut is, up, is up to wait five a is doable. I'm summing five up what you ten, said. Five to ten is difficult. Right. Not and what that's, over ten is dangerous. Right. Now, what is, is that clear? What, what is I'm, your point? My point is, is that in a speech, Andy had said that five. I've to just ten. repeated it, Anna. You let heard him, it. Let her finish, for goodness' sake. Come on, say it now. In a up speech. Andy had said that 5 to 10%, his words, was doable. Mm. I Difficult, just want to know... Doable. No, you well, that's said... that's what he said already. I've just said it, again. Oh, He's saying you're going to do more than that, that's the point. Can we, can we answer right. the I'm going to leave this... Can I answer the gentleman's question? Yes, you can. I'm going to leave the point, because we're getting nowhere. Yes. Because he's changed his mind. Can, can, can yes, ask you, uh, surveillance. Um, France expanded its surveillance powers last December, and the Charlie Hebdo attacks happened the following month. They expanded their surveillance powers in July after Charlie Hebdo, and these attacks happened in November. Please let's not assume that mass surveillance is some sort of magic bullet. Some of the most repressive countries on earth, with some of the most powerful security services, Saudi, Iran, China, Russia, have had mass casualty terrorist attacks on their soil. This is not some kind of salver bullet that every time there's a terrorist attack, we increase surveillance powers, we increase, we, uh, we get more counter-terror laws, uh, we don't care about civil liberties. That's what the terrorists Stop want. It. They want to turn open societies into closed societies. <laughs> they want to turn... Uh, no, no, all right, Max Hastings. Yeah, same rules for I, you I as I for everybody else. I agree with that, but we've also got to remember that um, a, a range of plots has been um, frustrated in the last year, in the last 10 years, which are overwhelmingly due to electronic surveillance. But it's a question, what is, what is obvious? Our parents and grandparents had to defend themselves with Spitfires and anti-aircraft guns. It's obvious that when we're dealing with a threat of this seriousness, and it is serious, it's not like the Nazis, it's not like the Soviet Union, but it's serious enough, we have to review at every level, including the police, including the intelligence, including inter electronic surveillance, what we do. But it must always be a proportionate response, and we have to keep our head. The president and I have to say, he's going to amend listen, the Constitution. listening to the... Um, representatives of the two main parties arguing about police funding in a debate on the issue of this seriousness is deeply depressing. I want to take a question from Emily Otvos, please. Emily Otvos. Do Muslims have a responsibility for controlling and preventing radicalisation? Do Muslims take a responsibility or have a responsibility for controlling and preventing radicalisation? Um, Evgeny. Yes, absolutely. I, I, I think we need to hear more moderate Muslims speaking out um, against what's happening 
um, in Islamic State against Islamic State's policy and um, I would very, really, really, really hope that we'll hear more of that. And of course the other point to make is that the coalition that I was talking about earlier has to include Muslim countries because I, I, that's absolutely crucial part of, I, um, I, of, of war against Islamic State. I think that's a worrying statement because I think if we hold, after an event like Paris, if we hold all Muslims somehow, somehow responsible or we ask them that they, they need to somehow uh, feel a special responsibility for it. We are stigmatizing yeah, yeah. huge communities. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's what ISIS wants. Yeah, yeah. That's what ISIS wants. But I didn't say that. What I said is I'd like to hear more moderate Muslims voicing their opinion against they did. ISIS. They did. They did. But they I would like to hear more. All right. Well, what about a march of moderates? What but, about. But that implies that we're specially, that Muslims are specially responsible for no, something. No. I have nothing to do with ISIS. I know you don't. My daughter has nothing to do with ISIS. My 77 year old father has nothing to do with ISIS. In fact, <laughs> But more in people fact, should say but, we don't have Yevgeny, anything. Yevgeny, Yevgeny, last week two of the attackers in Paris, two of the two of the attackers in Paris uh, were two of the attackers in Paris were guys who owned a bar and sold a bar six weeks before the attacks. Not my definition of no, devout Muslim. Should I ask bar owners to go on a march? No, All right, you made the point. Thank, thank you, Medi. Medi, Medi, thank you. Please, I know you're getting angry, but please. I'm not getting angry at all. I think well, all right, but I'm not angry. I just want, to, I want everybody to be able to hear what's said. The person is waving there. <laughs> but he tells us to. Yeah, me. I was the one who asked the question, and I think that, I don't think that Muslims have any more right than anyone else to take responsibility for preventing radicalization. These, these ISIS militants come in and destroy our Western democracy, and as a society, we all, at a basic humanity level of, of humanity, have a responsibility for preventing radi radicalization. Right. This happens in schools, it happens in everyday communities. We all need to take responsibility yeah. for this. And saying that Muslims alone should take responsibility just it I encourages so Islamophobia. Right. No, didn't. I didn't say alone. The, the, man, the man there, the third, fourth in, yes, you, sir. I'm a teacher. And I take your point about Muslims not dying exactly who the suicide bombers are. But when I taught in Luton, we were once asked by the mosques to any students liable to radicalization to them to be de radicalized or, or be talked to. And we were like, one minute, we are a group of white English teachers. How the hell are we supposed to know who they are? So we sent all of them to them in the end, but that's all we could do. But I think, yeah, we don't have a clue. I hope mosques might have more of a clue than we would. Uh, Andy Burnham. Well, I think politicians particularly need to take great care in making statements of the kind that you're, ob you're objecting to. Uh, earlier in the summer, the Prime Minister, I think, made a speech where he said parts of the Muslim community were quietly condoning extremism. Now, that alienates, at a stroke, the very people that you need to be working with together, hand in hand, uh, to, to deal uh, with the issue. So I, I, I take the point entirely where you're coming from. However, and this is to give a nod to Evgeny, Sadiq Khan, one of the most prominent, the most prominent uh, Muslim politician in the country, has today said that he, most prominent Muslims should do more to take on the cancer of extremism, which, which in his words. So I think from him, coming from him, that is an important statement. And I think people uh, do want to, to, to hear that. But it's about, as you're saying, everybody across community is, is everybody's issue because it's not a religion it's a perversion of Islam as we've said you know often it's because communities are very disenfranchised in France or in this country where people feel like they're second-class citizens where they don't get the same opportunities in life there's some deep-seated causes of this and we need a more sophisticated and, and response. Andy, uh, yeah. he's, he, uh, if I just say one thing to add to Sadiq's exact words where Muslims should stop burying their head in the ground and and speak out against this cancerous growth that grows in the it face of the Muslim Council of Britain today. Anna Subri. I was just going to say, every single leading cleric and leader of Muslim communities came out and signed a statement condemning what had happened in Paris and indeed in other terror attacks by ISIS. And it's really sad that it didn't get the publicity that it deserved. So this idea... <laughs> that the Muslim community is not doing its bit is not true. And I just think it's worth remembering, actually more Muslims died in Paris than actually committed those atrocities. Max Hastings. One thing we haven't said so far this evening that I do think bears saying, um, I for one, I doubt if anybody else in, in this um, hall would disagree, I'm absolutely confident that we're gonna win this. That although what's happening is horrendous, 
that ISIS is a death cult born out of the deep frustration in extremist Muslim circles, that it has nothing to offer. All the hard-working, sensible, um, law-abiding Muslims around the world who are just getting on with their lives, it has nothing to offer the world at large. And whereas communism or fascism pose far more serious threats, and I do think that we ought to, as we approach the, to get towards the end of this program, um, there's every reason to feel an optimism, despite um, this ghastly event in Paris and despite whatever may happen here. We are much stronger than they are because our values are incomparably more worthwhile than theirs. I'll take, I'll take two or three more points from, from people in the audience who haven't spoken. You, sir. Um, following on from Mehdi's point, isn't it also important to analyse the fact that the vast majority of the victims of ISIS are Muslims? Yes. They're the Shias in Baghdad. Yes. They're the Shias and the um, liberal Gay Sunnis Muslims. in Beirut. This is not um, a war from ISIS on necessarily Christians or the West. It's also a war on Muslims. Yes. Okay. Mill millions and of well refugees said. in and, Europe. And, the, and yeah. the woman in the Absolutely second right. row from the back there. I can just see your head. Yeah. Yes. Hi. I'd like to ask Evgeny, um, instead of perhaps asking Muslims to take responsibility, should he not perhaps ask the media to take responsibility for pro propagating this affiliation between Muslims and ISIS when actually that just feeds into Islamophobia and alienates Muslims? Yeah. Well, you have to speak for the whole media, not just your own particular bit. <laughs> I, I shall. I, um, I'll say that the war that's being waged against us is actually a different war, as Max rightly pointed out. It's not the wars that we used to fight. It's waged on three fronts. One is on the ground, uh, one is information war, which you've just mentioned, and the third one is ideological war. And you're right, it is a very, very fine balance. And I know that editors, editors that work for my newspapers and other newspapers, have to come up against a very, very difficult decision on a daily basis of whether to give um, coverage to particular atrocities that are being committed. But where do you draw the line? Where do you stop showing the, um, the public? Where do, you show, where do you stop showing them what actually is happening? So, for example, when Stephen Sotlov, um, the American journalist, was beheaded, the editor of The Independent took the decision not to put uh, Jihadi John on the front page in his orange boiler suit, but to put a photograph of Stephen Sotlov uh, when he was a younger man, when he was still free. So, you know, where do you draw the line? Well, what do you is your stop? objection, actually, to the way the media cover this? Well, it, I think a lot of what matters is not what you show, but how you show it. Um, well, for example, I take objection to the fact that it, we even refer to this terrorist group as Islamic State. Where, where, at what point <laughs> have they, are they acting? They may, if, if I call myself a zebra, do you, do you then refer to me as a zebra? <laughs> no, it's very good point. OK. Very and, very and you, sir, down here in the third row. Yes, you. A quick point, if you oh, would. Okay. Yes. What are we doing as a, as a British society and government that we, that we continuously lose our young people to ISS and others? Well, well, we've got a series of programmes which have been running very successfully where we engage with clerics, community leaders, so that we make sure that we undermine and we challenge and tackle this, this, this awful dogma, this jihadism that has been put it and, and is said to be in some way uh, part of Islam. It's not. It's completely contrary. And we make that argument and it's done by brilliant people who often do it voluntarily within the Muslim community so that we start. That's such an important way right. so that we stop this from happening in the very first place. But on, this is not going to be a short term. It's going to take on, a long time. On, on that note, we've had, we've had an hour. We've aired a number of issues, but we can't go on longer. But I hope some of the things we've said have been both helpful and interesting to people watching. Thank you all in the audience very much. I've been getting away with it all my